Uh, Dan and I just came back. Is that too loud? We just got back from the Global Atheist Convention in Australia. And I know that PZ Myers was there. I don't know if anyone else made it. But there were 4,000 people there. It was the largest uh, free thought conference in history. And um, those Aussie atheists were really impressive. And most of them were uh, Aussies. Um, but there were people from 40 countries. And there were the Four Horsemen, what they called the Four Horsemen, Dawkins, Dennett, Harris. And Hitch, of course, wasn't out there. There was a very nice memorial for Christopher Hitchens. But Ayan Hirsi Ali took his place. She was originally supposed to be part of that. I don't know if you know about that, that video where they talk. But um, I would say that half of the people there were college students. So I'm delighted to see this kind of interest. And how many, by the way, in the audience are college students or recent grads? I mean, show of hands. So most of you are. Well, good, because that's what I prepared for. Um, I went to college here. I was born here. And um, I was sort of the lone atheist activist in my day. And that was a long time ago. But it's thrilling to know that 600 people signed up for this conference and that there's this kind of energy and activism, and I commend Mike and Chris and AHA and all of the volunteers who worked so hard to put this together. And FFRF is very proud to be a part of it, to have helped support it. Um, as Andrew mentioned, and that was a great talk um, by Andrew, who's our fourth new staff attorney, um, I am one of the co founders of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and FFRF started as a local group when I was a college student in 1976. And my mother and I decided to do something about prayer at city councils and county board meetings. And it took about a year, but we got them to stop. And we thought it would seem a little weak if we just went in the two of us, so we ought to uh, have a name and say we were with a group. <laughs> and we've always thought it was terribly important to emphasize that in order to have religious liberty, you have to have the freedom to dissent. And there is no freedom of religion without the principle of freedom from religion. So we came up with an alliterative name and many people wanted to join us, and the rest is history. We thought maybe it would only take a few years to correct perceptions about this being a Christian nation, and the pendulum would swing back, and here we are 30 plus years later. But we have grown to 18,000 members, and we're the largest atheist agnostic membership organization in the country, based here in Madison, Wisconsin, a welcoming home, and we're a very active state church watchdog. And as a college student, I had one of my favorite and one of my easiest victories. As a sophomore, I discovered that um, there were invocations and benedictions at the graduation ceremonies, and I thought that was very rude, very unwelcoming to the many foreign students, and to myself, eventually, an atheist. They were Christian prayers, and I went before a four-person senior class council. They were in charge of the commencement. They may still be. It was the easiest persuasion job of my life, a couple of minutes talking about the Constitution and how unwelcoming this was. They agreed with me, and they took it to the chancellor, and he agreed with them, and we ended a more than 140-year violation. So one person can make a difference, and sometimes it's not as hard as you would think. Um, and you've, you've seen uh, Hemet talk about student activists, Jessica Alquist. Uh, there are so many. And um, you're going to be hearing soon from my, one of my favorite champions of the First Amendment, Ellery Shem. And you'll see what he did as a high school student to end violations for students around the country. Um, and I'm proud that he's an FFRF lifetime member and that he remains a passionate advocate for separation of church and state. We're very grateful to him. Now, after I graduated, I uh, maintained ties here at the university. And I was one of the plaintiffs in our first lawsuit against the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Now, I, you wouldn't know this, but when you registered as a student, in addition to all the information they collected and all the classes, and this all used to be paperwork, there was something called a religious preference box. And it was very tiny type, and it listed all kinds of weird churches and general churches and mainstream churches, and you were supposed to indicate what you were. And they didn't tell you this, but they took your private information, your name and your address, and probably your phone number, this is pre-email, and they gave it willy-nilly to any campus ministry that asked for it. And the campus, uh, the University of Wisconsin, was proselytizing on behalf of churches, helping them recruit. So we sued, and we also um, had a student, uh, active student sue, but my standing at that time was not challenged, which is interesting. And 
And the university said, why don't we add atheist agnostic slash freedom from religion? And our attorney at the time, we were in federal court, he said, well, you know, that's a pretty good compromise. Why don't we go for it? Um, so we agreed, although I, we weren't real happy with it. And the dean of students forgot to add this. And he didn't even apologize when we pointed it out. And so when we insisted, you've got to follow the law, we're going back to court, they dropped it. So it's off the, the uh, registration form. But that's the way things used to be. And um, let's see, um, we've had many at Tulsa, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and one of the uh, constant complaints we've had over the years is that the Gideons will go two, three times a year and pass out Bibles in front of University Hospital entrance. And I don't know how many of you have ever been to University Hospitals, but you have to drive there. And it's not a city sidewalk, it's just a little sidewalk before you go in the entrance. And these are patients who are ill, they're concerned families, and also staff who are continually having to deal with Bible thumpers. This has been going on for 30 plus years, handing out Bibles, you know, throwing them at them. And uh, we even picketed, we couldn't do anything about it, we complained over the years. But when Dan and I were in Australia, another complaint came in, and I'm very pleased to announce uh, Stephanie Schmidt, who's been volunteering, and she's one of our attorneys at our table. You meet her, the blonde. Um, she wrote a letter of complaint with Susan Lund, who was here earlier today, one of our interns, and they've agreed to quit. They're going to tell the Gideon, stay off University of Wisconsin Hospital property. So we're very <laughs> got started, and I'm a third generation free thinker on my mother's side of the family. I, I like to call myself a secular Pippa. God wasn't in, in his heaven, all was right with my world. Um, and I agree with Ernestine L. Rose, the um, 19th century feminist free thinker, that all children are born atheists and would remain atheists if they were not inculcated in religion. Maybe they're not born rationalists, but they are certainly born without theism. And young minds should not be troubled um, or lives blighted by frightening abstractions. And they should not be shamed. They should not be taught that absurd fables are reality. How can somebody look at the face of a baby and think original sin? You know, maybe original mischief as a toddler. Um, Ruth Green, who wrote The Born Again Skeptic's Guide to the Bible, and I, I think there might be one more book of that left. It's the first book I've ever published, and it's still in print. It's wonderful. It sort of takes off where Thomas Paine left off. Um, she asked, if the concept of a father who plots to have his own son put to death is presented to children as beautiful and as worthy of society's admiration, what types of human behavior can be presented to them as reprehensible? Um, so my mother and Nicole Gaylor, who's now 85, and I started the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and it was really my mother's early work as an abortion rights advocate in the state of Wisconsin that opened up her eyes and my eyes as a middle schooler following her around to the necessity of keeping and getting dogma out of our laws. You probably don't know that Wisconsin was the last state in the union to allow unmarried people the right to purchase contraception. And you may know that Griswold versus, um, what was it, Griswold versus Connecticut was 1955. It, it took as long as 1974 in the state of Wisconsin for that to be overturned. And if we were waiting for the Wisconsin state legislature to overturn it, it would still be an, in, an, a crime for unmarried to purchase uh, contraception. That was done by state. It was referred to as indecent articles, and pharmacists would lock the contraceptives up behind the counter. And you could be quizzed, now some of them ignored it, but you could be quizzed if you went over to the rent -a -bombs, now Walgreens, to buy condoms, for example. And that was the Comstock Act dating to the 1870s. So um, we have a lot of problems in this state with religion and government. And like uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we agreed and became aware that the Bible and Christianity are the greatest stumbling blocks in the way of women's emancipation and our rights. Um, and every right that women have won, uh, from being able to wear slacks, uh, to riding bicycles, to voting, to ownership of our own body has been opposed by the churches and the religious lobby. And it is the religious lobby, and only the religious lobby, as Andrew pointed out, that is exclusively fighting gay rights and today's marriage equality in embryonic stem cell research. Religious is, religion is the greatest impediment to civil rights 
into moral, social, and scientific progress. We um, have grown from those original two of us at FFRF um, to, as I said, more than 18,000. And we, uh, in, uh, only in very recent years have we had more than three or four staff members, but we are now 13 paid full-time staff members. We have four staff attorneys who work very diligently for you and the complainants that come in about state church violations. And we have part-time students and interns and volunteers. And if you don't know it, we are in downtown Madison. We're only about 10 minutes away by walk. And we hope you will visit us in our website and our table. And if you are a student or a grad student, we would hope you would consider entering our essay competitions. We have now three of them, depending on what level you are in class. And um, it's a first prize of 2,000. It goes down to honor rolls of 200. And Andrew won one of our first uh, competitions for grad students, and that's how we met him. And um, we also have student activist awards. Last year, we gave out six to student activists. They were $1,000 each. Jessica Alcos, one of them. They were all high school students. So we, we see, as Hemet pointed out, uh, high school students are the ones really butting their heads against religion and classes. Um, FFRF's honorary directors include Ron Reagan, the son of, and Julia Sweeney, and Steven Pinker, and Oliver Sachs, and Dawkins, and Dennett, and um, the late Christopher Hitchens, and it really is a time of renaissance for free thought. Um, but we have a lot of work to do to make sure the Enlightenment is not blown out. And I know you've heard it, but I'm going to repeat that it is a scary statistic that over half of the U.S. population rejects evolution. Because what does this say? When our, a superpower looks to the supernatural, which uh, engages in primitive thinking instead of critical thinking, this is very dangerous. FFRF has taken more than 50 lawsuits, and we have ended countless constitutional violations with, with court and without going to court. I want to mention a few of them. Uh, we are suing over a cross on a water tower in Tennessee. We are protesting that designation of 2012 as Year of the Bible in Pennsylvania. Um, we are suing over Ten Commandments in a school in Virginia where the Liberty Council is doing everything they can to out our 16-year-old secret plaintiff on making no bail, keeping the name uh, uh, private because they want to hound him and they want to, to get the student to drop out. And uh, I'm going to repeat what Andrew said, the First Commandment is the antithesis of the First Amendment because a school, a government has no business telling a student or a citizen how many gods to have, or uh, which God to have, or whether to have any gods at all. We have a case that may turn into a lawsuit in Pennsylvania where there's a huge Eagles Ten Commandment in front of a high school. It happens to be the Catholic version because it doesn't have any reference to graven images, and they are saying it has to stay there. So um, there are so many violations, so, so little time. Um, and just before Easter, I'll get this to work, we um, put up this banner in a, um, a park in Streeter, Illinois, because a gentleman has been allowed to put up nativity scenes for months at the end of the year, and then he's been allowed to put up three crosses in this sign, Jesus died for your sin, at Easter time. And when our, one of our attorneys, Patrick Elliott, complained, they said, oh, it's OK. Anybody can put up anything. It's a public forum. So we decided to test it with this banner, Nobody Died for Our Sins. And uh, it was put up just before Easter, and guess how long it lasted? Less than a day. Um, and so Patrick and one of our student uh, volunteers, Ryan, did a six hour round trip uh, trip, uh, trip to um, put up a replacement that they, they got done when we were in Australia, and they added a postscript. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal. So uh, I'd like to talk about some timely things. Um, you may have known about FFRF's challenge, we thought it was very historic, of the National Day of Prayer. That's coming right up. That's this Thursday. The first Thursday of every May is designated by your Congress and your President and your Governor and usually your mayors and county execs as the National Day of Prayer. And that
that happened um, because of Billy Brent. He had a soul winning thing going on for six weeks on the steps of the Capitol, and he had this fervent prayer, he said, that Congress would adopt a national day of prayer. And he longed to see public officials kneeling in prayer to the Almighty and proclaiming Jesus Christ the Lord. How's that for a secular purpose? So of course Congress did it. And uh, we receive so many complaints every year. It's created such a um, snowballing effect of violations, a lot of prayer breakfast by public officials, and so on. And then it's been co-opted by the National Day of Prayer Task Force there in Colorado Springs, housed in Focus on Family Land, um, where they hold all kinds of events, and they only allow fundamentalist Christians to attend, because it has the blessings of the government. And so we took this lawsuit, and we've never fought harder, and we were paid off with a decision um, in uh, 2010 by Judge Barbara Crabb here in Madison in federal court. It was a thrilling victory, and she agreed with us that it is unconstitutional for the president to exhort citizens to pray, to much less to set aside an entire day every year for prayer, and to give you a laundry list of what to pray about. And she pointed out, if a president can tell you to set aside a day for prayer, what is to stop the president from issuing a national day of blasphemy? Uh, the top executive officer of the country could no more do a national day of prayer than tell people to fast during Ramadan, or attend a synagogue, or purify themselves in a sweat lodge, or practice doing magic. And these are her wonderful words. Um, and uh, un unfortunately, um, we did have, Obama did appeal that decision. We started that with Bush. It went, uh, he, he made that decision in less than a day. It went before the Seventh Circuit. It's the luck of the draw. We drew three bad judges, and they did not throw the case out on its merits. The merits were not overturned, per se. They threw it out on standing. Um, and um, we have a uh, Supreme Court with six Catholics out of nine, five of them voting as a block. Um, we, it was one of the saddest decisions of my life not to appeal that ruling. But we continue to fight it. Um, and it is not just a constitutional affront to our conscience, it's an intellectual affront to our reason to have public officials telling us to pray because nothing fails like prayer, as we say around FFRF, that's my mother's mantra. The unanswered prayers could fill the universe. The cemeteries are full of people who pray to live. We all know wishful thinking cannot suspend the natural laws of the universe. And uh, if we, these huge problems that we face as a country and as a world, we must fix ourselves. And this is our message. <laughs> this, this is our message to repair whom we sued over his day of prayer. This is our message to pious politicians. Get off your knees and get to work. And uh, by the way, we're read, reading a version of this and that God fixation banner that we started this with um, in time to put it as your cover photo on Facebook. So don't just do Facebook. The Facebook is a good way. It's a meme. Get out that word. Um, so if you want to protest the National Day of Prayer, we'll have those up at our website by the end of Monday um, so that you can place that message there in time to protest Thursday's unconstitutional proclamations, which go, you know, will be um, not just at the federal level, but at the state and, and county. And I just want to say a little bit about Santorum. You know, he has uh, now thankfully uh, retired from the race, but you probably heard that he said that when he heard the remarks of John F. Kennedy as a candidate, a Catholic candidate himself in 1960, to the ministers of Houston saying that I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, when he heard those words, Santorum wanted to vomit. So this is what we wanted to tell Santorum. Santorum and this ran on um, CBS, NBC, Nationwide. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace. Let's restore respect for America's secular roots help the Freedom From Religion Foundation defend the wall of separation between state and church. Join us at FFRF.org. Freedom depends on freethinkers. That was very, very satisfying to be able to run that on the uh, Sunday morning news, CBS, and Rachel Maddow, Meet the Press. Uh, 
um, and it is precisely the mythic character of the um, divinity that makes it so very dangerous because anything goes if you believe in this. And if you think you're among the righteous, you get to interpret the word of God and among the most righteous ones, the most dangerous ones currently in the United States is the largest denomination in the United States and there had the US Catholic Conference of Bishops. And it is absolutely outrageous that healthcare reform and that women's right to contraception could be held hostage by the Catholic Church that this could even be debated. And here is the historic ad that we ran in March in the New York Times. It's time to quit the Catholic Church. Um, that New York Times made us change the headline was punchier. <laughs> they made us change it from it's time to quit the Catholic Church to it's time to consider quitting the Catholic Church. And it was an open letter to nominal um, and liberal Catholics who are planning to run it in the Washington Post. Uh, while the House is in, in session in two weeks, and we'd love your support on that. Um, you can go to our website, but this ad says, asks Catholics, do you choose reproductive freedom or do you want to go back to the dark ages? Do you choose women and our rights or bishops and their wrongs? No president should have to genuflect before the US Catholic Conference of Bishops or any religious denomination. And we urged nominal and liberal Catholics to join those of us who put humanity above dogma, to stop sending their children to broken schools to be indoctrinated into the next generation of voters and donors. And we pointed out their misplaced loyalty after two, and actually it's three decades, of sex scandals with praying, priests, church complicity, collusion, and cover-up going all the way to the top. That was in the New York Times. We think it was very important that it be stated. Um, we didn't have space for all our favorite lines. One of them was, life begins at excommunication. <laughs> and why not choose contraception instead of immaculate conception? But as you can see, we ended with a pun, please exit en masse. And this is the state church issue of our day. It is a huge attack, not just on secular government, but on women's rights. Um, and I'd like to kind of wrap this up, and not quite over, but I have a little bit of show and tell, with a quote from a Wisconsin State Supreme Court decision. Uh, I should have made you guess, I guess, um, but I'm gonna tell you that back in 1890, the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled that there, might, there may not be Bible reading in Wisconsin public schools. And I wonder if you can guess the denomination of the plaintiffs who took that case. Catholics. Because when they were a minority, they were among the most important state church plaintiffs because they knew what it was like to be a minority and to be, have the government try to tell their children they should be reading the King James Version of the Bible. And this decision was won in, in 1890. Our schools really were very secure until about the 60s from religion because of it. Um, and this was more than 70 years before Ellen Rishemp had to take this case all over again uh, to the Supreme Court. But I'd like to read just a paragraph from one, of, uh, one part of that decision. There is no such source and cause of strife, quarrel, fights, malignant opposition, persecution, and war, and all evil in the state as religion. Let it once enter our civil affairs the government would soon be destroyed. Let it once enter our common schools, they would be destroyed. And now I would just like to end with, um, as, as Hemet pointed out, I mean, we can look at a kindergarten drawing that shows the discrimination against freethinkers, but there's actually social research. The University of Minnesota, Minnesota has done a major study, it was 2006, where they compiled a list of the status of the outgroups, and that included gays, African Americans, Arabs, Muslims, uh, women, and atheists from the 1960s until the present. And everybody had moved up the social totem pole and gained social acceptance with the exception of atheists. We're prostitutes, we're criminals. You wouldn't want anyone in your family to marry one. And when I, um, we interviewed, um, Penny Edgell on, on Free Thought Radio, when I said, well, how do they get these crazy stereotypes? She said, there's a lot of people in this country who've never knowingly met an atheist. So we want 
to introduce atheists and agnostics, free thinkers. We're our best advertisement. And uh, so we're with Dawkins. We need to come out of the closet. And this is the Freedom from Religion Foundation's uh, Out of the Closet campaign. That's actually my daughter, Sabrina, our daughter, Sabrina, who came up with this idea. Um, uh, and here's high schoolers in Raleigh, South Carolina, who have been persecuted in their high school, putting it on the line. This was up in their county. Um, very lovely. Um, this is a truck driver in Raleigh. I'm saved from religion. A family in Raleigh, another happy humanist family. This is the Bible Belt. Um, this is what a secular family looks like. So we've done these campaigns in about six cities, including Madison. Here's a campaign in Tulsa. People of logic don't belong in the minority. I can be moral without religion. Another atheist for peace and world harmony. Um, Compassion is my religion. These, uh, this is somebody connected with the Secular Student Alliance who helped us. A lot of their students volunteered for our Columbus, Ohio campaign. I see beauty in the universe without God. Ashley, some of you probably know her. Um, and Dylan, I can be good without God. This guy was moved twice because a church complained and then a businessman complained. I don't believe in Zeus either. <laughs> There's Julia Sweeney. And why isn't this working? There we go. Um, this is uh, Elliot, uh, Patrick Elliott, one of our attorneys, going from Catholic to atheist. Set me free. Um, I'm, why isn't this working? There's a couple more. There we go. Um, uh, Barbara, who used to run Dardanelles, it's not what you believe, but how you behave. Barbara Wright. There's Dan. I just love faith and faith. going so well. There's just a couple more. I don't know why this is stuck. Well, I was just going to end with the theme of our campaign. Oh, here. So we can't put everyone on a billboard, but this is our out virtual billboard campaign at our website. You can go to fffrf.org slash out. Make your own virtual billboard, and we'll put it up at our website. And next week, we're debuting a video out of the closet. If you do something 60 seconds or less, you put it on YouTube. We approve it. We put up your message. The whole idea is to just blanket the internet with positive images of free thinkers. Let people see you and know who you are. And um, Richard Dawkins was the first one to participate in our virtual billboard campaign. That was awfully nice of him. There you'll see Daniel Dennett, um, Steven Pinker, um, Pete Singer, but it's full of just ordinary people. Keeping my kids free from religious dogma. Here's somebody in the military. My ancestors worked to free our bodies. Now I work to free our minds. And then this um, is Grace Quiroz, who is outside Nashville, and she won our contest. This was our favorite. So we put her on the real billboard. It was just up last month. This is what an atheist looks like. We're going to be doing a lot more with that campaign. We're going to be making that available for your Facebook um, profile as well. So come out of the closet. I know most of you are, but um, it's fun. <laughs> and here's one of our favorite billboards, and reason we trust. And I guess this is what our panel will be talking about later. Thank you very much.